Welcome back again to Walking Away from Arcadia. Today, Simon and I are going to talk about a subject that is less about digging into and ripping the canon or the rules apart, and more something a little more abstract, one might even say unshaped. What does it mean to tell a good Changeling the Dreaming story? This episode is for the storytellers. How do you build a good campaign? How do you put together a good story? How do you engage? All of those things. We both have thoughts on this and varying levels of experience with different types of stories, but I'm going to go ahead and punt this one over to Simon just to get us started because he has a little bit more storytelling experience in Changeling than I do. How have you gone about building the story in your current chronicle, which I think is your longest chronicle to date at this point? It is my longest running chronicle to date. So this one kind of came about in a really roundabout sort of way. I, it was originally completely different. It was going to start in the present day and involve a level of cooperation between the she and the Nunihi because they both had oaths with each other and the she and the Nunihi sometimes have a decent relationship, often not, but more often it's better than the Nunihi's relationship with the commoners for fairly obvious reasons. Like, I couldn't get anybody to bite, because I wanted about half of the players to be Kithane, preferably she, but didn't have to be, and about half of the players to be different kinds of Nunahi, and everybody wanted to play Nunahi. So I tabled that one, and I came at it from another angle and moved it backwards about a hundred years, give or take, and set it during the interregnum, and... There are no she anywhere to be found, and suddenly people are playing Kithane. So it's interesting, because in the past we've done a she-only game that went catastrophically poorly and was abandoned very prematurely, basically through complete consent on all parties. I think like doing most sorts of role-playing games, there's a really strong element of you need to know your audience going on. I agree with that. You know, it is interesting that everyone ended up playing Nunahi when you wanted to do the Nunahi She collaboration game, and now everyone's playing Cathane. We well, it's not that everybody's playing Cathane. It's just that there are people playing Cathane now. <laughs> well, that's true. I have found that getting that cross Cathane Nunahi setup is a challenge. In my current game, I knew I wanted to involve the Nunahi and the Cathane in the story from the beginning. And so I told my players, you know, it's kind of all on the table. You can play any of the main kith. You can play any of the Nunahi families. If you want to play any of the sort of weirder Ghislaine, you'll have to justify it. But if it makes sense, sure, you can play it. Like if someone wants to play a Gilly-Do, I'm probably going to put the kibosh on that because we might want to travel at some point. You know, but aside from that, nobody can play Warple Tinger, but go nuts. Everyone played a mainline kith. No one touched the Nunahi. And I'm like, well, okay. I guess I can have the Nunahi entirely in NPC territory. It wasn't what I had in mind, but mm, I'm not for, you know, dictating things for my players. And I just find that tends to be the case. I don't know. It. I'm having to take a step back from my original plans. I'm going to definitely have the Nunahi be part of the story, but something I believe very strongly in is you tell the story your players want to play. And it will almost never be the story you open with. It just never works out that way. The pitfall in telling the story that your players want to play, at least for me, is sometimes my players want to play a story I think is terrible. We had a mage game that traveled pretty far into murder hobo territory, and mage is a weird choice for that. Yeah, mage is a very weird choice for that. I... I have had similar problems with mage players wanting to get into murder hobo territory. At one point, I actually dealt with it by engaging with the Fae, because it's amazing, as powerful as mages are, you start dragging changeling elements in there, and they're like, I don't know what's going on. I'm a mage, I always know what's going on. I don't know how I feel about this. It makes me very uncomfortable. And it, it does tend to rein things in in strange and unusual ways. But yeah, Murder Hobo territory is even weirder in Changeling because oh, 
you know, when you get that in Mage, there's the whole Paradox Repercussions theme. Murder Hobo and Changeling is just, okay, everybody's in their Unseelie legacy. Cool. What are we doing here? Like, there, there are so few repercussions, and by few, I mean none that are not inflicted by a particular storyteller. You know, you can't go around killing dreamers, I suppose, or you'll end up with a bunch of banality, but hey, if the people you're killing aren't particularly attuned to the dreaming, then whoops, nobody cares. It's It creates an interesting space, and I feel like, you know, as much as what I just said about running the game your players want to play... And I do believe that in terms of like theme and setting and don't get too political if your players don't want to be political and that sort of thing. There's something to be said for, you know, not giving your players too many opportunities to be murder hobos if you really don't feel comfortable telling that story. There are a lot of really basic choices you could make around assembling a changeling game. One of the big ones being your players. What sort of characters you're going to try to encourage them to play or what sorts of characters you're going to disallow straight off because there are a few of those you also have some interesting choices in timeline and setting because the canon is very strange and changeling then location like specific location whether you're doing a traveling game whether you're doing a game that's geographically linked like that has an immediate effect on what's available for players because the Nunahi a little bit, the Inanime kind of a lot, and the Gilidu and the Selkies to a degree are all limited by location. Yeah, and there I mean there are some other kiths that suffer from the same problem. Arguably the Menahune. I mean, you take a Menahune out of Hawaii, especially one of the Ali'i, man, that's not gonna work out for them. That's just not going to work out for them at all. River hags are kind of the same way. And so, you know, there's something to be said for sitting down and having the conversation, even before character creation. If your players are savvy about, do you want to play an animist game? And I almost wish that there was a text out there somewhere on, here are the animist fae, because by and large, all the fae that are tied to a location are animist. The selkies... A little bit less so. With the Selkies, they aren't tied to a specific location like an anchor or a river, but they need to be near water. Like, you can't have a Selkie in Colorado. That's just not going to work. You have to have them on a coast or at least by, you know, a lake or something. You know, sitting down and saying, do you feel comfortable being tied to a place like this? What's the scope of the game? And getting a sense for that before you open up character creation opportunities. Because... You know, if you have a Pisky and a Gillydew in your character group, you're going to have problems. Because the Pisky sooner or later is going to be like, I'm bored, I need to find a new group of people, let's go somewhere else. And the Gillydew is going to be like, uh, fuck me? Like, what? I feel like there's a lot more of those sorts of conflicts in Changeling than most of the other games. Like, you have the Ravnos in Vampire or the Zemisi you know, where one travels constantly and one is tied to their earth. But that's about it, and neither of those are, are mainline character types. Whereas, you know, in Mage, you really have none of that. In Wraith, you have none of that. Everybody's sort of tied to their fetters. But then in Changeling, you have these really shockingly incompatible character types. The Wurpletinger is a perfect example. I mean, they literally destroy freeholds they are next to. They are exactly the opposite of the Animist kiths. They have to keep moving to avoid staying around any given freehold long enough to destroy it. That's just going to wreck any, a storyteller's story if that storyteller isn't really good at, you know, the Ravnos traveling, shifting, the story follows you, it isn't tied to a location story, and not everybody's good at that. So you really kind of have to treat all of the various kith groups as a potential toolbox and sort of build your streamlined toolbox and then hand it to the players and be like, okay, here's what you can pick. That's a bit more setup than some of the other games require. Yes, and the scope timeline-wise for your game also affects that, because in some ways you can do a long-form game that allows somebody to have a character that's temperamentally unfit for the group, because 
eventually it'll be able to leave or die, and the player stays and plays something else. That works in Changeling, because you can have that character, the initial character, come back later in another life, or even come back later when the current players are in another life, but they're not. Yeah, I know you've talked with me a lot about how some of those dynamics have played out in your game. I've never gotten to do any changeling that is long form enough to play around with those dynamics, and I'd really love to. You know, just I have to admit, all of the players I have had in my long form games, with one or two exceptions, were not changeling players. Some of them had just never gotten into it. Some of them were actually somewhat antagonistic towards Changeling the Dreaming, because I've run into more of that than I thought I would when I was younger. So I'm sort of living vicariously through your chronicle when you describe dynamics about it. I'm making mental note, because I'd love to play with those things eventually. But I would definitely need a different group. Yeah, one of my players right now is similar to me she's a compulsive character idea creator but doesn't actually enjoy playing them very much and just today we were having a conversation apropos of nothing and she was talking about how she's looking really forward to the game getting a little bit farther along in the real world timeline because she has this great idea for i think it was a clericon radio host and she was telling me about it and i was like you want to write, like, three paragraphs about this character so I can start using them as a mortal NPC now before they crystallize so that when your character you're playing right now eventually bails, we can just be like, oh, look, a chrysalis. Oh, it's that guy. We all know him. Okay, I just have to say, when you talk about, like, a Cluricon radio host, all I can think of is, oh, brother, where art thou? And the whole thing on the radio... And just wanting to play that fairy story in that weird Oedipus-like Appalachian setting with that Clerican radio host. And now I cannot get that out of my mind. Yeah, it, it's really funny because her, uh, her idea of this character is actually pretty well developed. Because she wants them to be instrumental in the creation of NPR, which I think is hilarious. Oh, that is fantastic. May they not come back with enough remembrance to see NPR's later manifestations. It is not the glamorous thing that it once was in so many ways. I can just, I cannot imagine being a changeling that created something that lasting And then having to see it in a later lifetime with a high remembrance score and remembering just enough of what you wanted to create. Like, I could see that being the most weird, esoteric, not totally understood banality trigger. And now I kind of want to build a story around something like that, because I think that could be really fascinating. Yeah, tangentially, I had a um, a cross-genre game. I was playing a Dantaine who was an NPR employee. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, one, I love that you were playing a Dantaine, given the conversations we've had about the Dantaine. That that was your black magician, wasn't it? Yes, that was totally a black magician. He he was a satyr black magician. His day job was working for the NPR Money Talks show. Okay, I just had a banality trigger listening to that. I just want you to know that. Like, there was there was a legit sinking feeling in my stomach as I envisioned this character. Oh, oh man, money, was great. money talks. I based him off of um, Satirius Johnson, the NPR radio host who got busted for having a double life where he, like, did, did this boring, prestigious job on the one hand during the day, took a nap, and then went off and did a bunch of ecstasy in clubs and raved a bunch, and then took a nap, went back to his boring day job. Oh, he was a burner. Oh, is that what he was? Yeah, he was a burner. Yeah, that's like, I mean, I know a handful of burners who are legitimate, full-time, you know, progressive hippie liberals, 
but honestly, the vast majority of the burners I read about and even have known are that. Day mm-hmm. trader during the day. Crazy, druggy, hippie, look at all the things I can buy with my day trader money that make me look like a more compelling, glow-up, blinking hippie by night. Mm-hmm. It's, a we- it's a weird scene. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, like, I saw that in the news, and I was just like, that is a changeling, Dante, and I am totally playing the shit out of that. I, that is a whole new perspective on the Dante that I'm, I don't know how I'm going to get that into my Asheville game, but it has to happen at some point. Contact right. Okay, engine stop. Houston, uh... Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Becca, don't you hear me when I'm talking to you? Can you believe we are up there right now? Are you still hooked on that radio? Becca, everybody knows that's only propaganda. Nobody's listening. It is hard to imagine that there's a human being so far away from here, isn't it? But they've done it. That man is out there right now. He's going to step onto the moon. How do you think it feels to float in space? To see the Earth from such a distance? If you want to know how it feels to reach the moon, try this acid. It'll give you the best trip of your life. Guaranteed. That's one small step for man. Let's go to the forest. Not so fast. What, are you 80 and can't keep up with me? Something's happening. Sure, you're tripping. Take it easy, Becca. Negative emotions can give you a bad trip, and look at that. It shouldn't have started yet. It doesn't take effect so quickly. There's a silver steam. It shines. It's beautiful. And it comes from inside of the forest. I have to see what it is. I'm looking for the source. Don't! Come back! Are you crazy? If something happens to you, the others are going to kill me. What... What are you? Where do you come from? You are so... So... I can't stop looking at you. Then do not stop doing it, daughter of Eve. What is this that I perceive in you? Can it be... Yes. I notice it. Fairy blood runs through your veins. Wait, I don't know if this is a good idea. Silence, mortal. You must not fear. Everything is fine. Trust me. Becca! Becca! Uh, If I don't find you, the others are going to kill me. Ah, there you are. Thanks God you're safe. Come on, let's go. Was it the acid? It didn't even work for me. I think we got a couple of real blotters. If I catch the guy that sold them to me, I'm having a word with him. You all right? You seem quiet. Don't worry, Adam. I'm I'm perfectly perfectly right. right. I've I've never never been been better. Remembrance is a great dynamic for building mythic characters in the modern age because you have this conflicted thing going on. Uh, Maybe a little bit less conflicted than my poor satyr, but you have this conflicted thing going on where you have all these dregs of past lives that are hanging on and the dreaming enforcing parts of them seemingly randomly, but especially oaths, 
and it's a neat way to throw in throw in DM compulsions that don't necessarily have to be the she lord wants you to do this. So thinking about some of the new arts and the fact that there's now an odes and contract system, I think there's a really interesting, compelling story set around having to quest into the dreaming. You know, most of the quest into the dreaming stories that I've heard about or seen are very high fantasy. But I love the idea of maybe one character in your motley, maybe your whole motley in a previous life was part of a major oath. And you're not fulfilling the oath, and so the dreaming is punishing you, but you don't remember your oath. And going through that whole complicated, can we somehow manipulate the mist somehow to get through them and get information that is past them back into the real world, which in theory is impossible, but that's the joy of fairy tales. What are you willing to bargain and give up? Like, a lot of those stories centered around more... Um, I'll say mainstream quest for the pot of gold kind of thing, but this whole idea of the oath that you is is haunting you and you don't know how to fulfill it, and what are you even going to give up to find out enough about it to fulfill it, and maybe the oath is abhorrent. There was a story I wanted to tell at one point because I had a particular player who was not a fan of Changeling at all, but I wanted to run Changeling for this group. And I still kind of have this chronicle in my back pocket. I don't think he listens to the podcast. Not this deep into the episodes. Who knows? Maybe I'm giving the the game away. Um, But I wanted to do basically a story where he was a a red cap. We're all pretty sure if we ever play this, he'll end up playing a red cap. And in a previous life, he had just been a horrible, fascist, autocratic, sort of genocidal character who had fed on these dreams of power and lust and you know there there been bits in the canon about red caps being that way and he's super progressive and the idea of like having to go through this quest to like cut through and find out what this thing is and where are these oaths that are punishing me and okay i need to fulfill them and then being presented with something like that and then potentially having that lead into how do i undo this how do i not be this which you know the primordial, awful, terrible thing you are in Changeling is a major thing to jump into one of the potential story hooks from a previous game. We've talked a little bit about hooks from Graceful Wicked Masks. There's this concept in Graceful Wicked Masks of questing into an unshaped fae, and you bring some of reality into that unshaped and help them understand creation a little more. But you also get to reshape yourself a little bit. You get to use some of that power that they have to become something else and build graces you know the idea that some parts of the dreaming could actually be an unshaped fae there's so much written about how the dreaming is sentient and that you could send modern changelings on a quest and they could rename themselves in ways more profound than even the naming art really allows technically fifth level naming lets you get pretty extreme with that but you can you know, kibosh that if it doesn't fit the story. I find that idea to be fascinating, and I loved the idea of kind of opening up that you played a red cap, and you knew you were kind of a bad guy, but no, really. So I think think there are a lot of potentially big mythic stories that can be tapped there, and if you have the right gaming group, you can tie them to actual historic events. You can tie them to actual things that have happened in the world that are pretty awful. Changeling can pretty mm-hmm. easily get into territory a lot like the Shoah book from Wraith, if you're willing to go there. We had a one-shot when I was in college that I ran, I think partly because I had picked up the Changeling 2nd Edition book and been like, oh my god, this is this is the game I've always wanted to play. I'm totally playing this. Oh, nobody wants to DM it. Okay, I'm DMing it. Like, already at that point, when I had just been exposed to it, I was already sick of the she Knight, and one of my players, who I knew fairly well, was going to play a she Knight no matter what. Like, we hadn't even talked about it, and he was going to play one, because he's a paladin. <clears throat> and I kind of fucked with that character pretty hard, because he was like, I'm going to play this knight, it's going to be amazing, I'm going to be upstanding and virtuous and a font of glamour for the world. And I was like, okay, cool, you don't know what your true name is, and you can't actually be sane, you need to go find out what your true name is. 
and I made the whole one-shot story about him trying to figure out why he can't be saned. Oh, I, I have to ask, what was the reason? The reason was... In his previous incarnation, he had also been an upstanding she knight, who the local she lord, because we were we were playing, you know, present day, so about ten years ago now, but well past the resurgence. And in his previous life, after the resurgence war, he was, you know, not an upstanding citizen, and his his lord had sent him out to root out a um, a witch, basically a red cap who was really old and had lots and lots of arts under her belt. He rode in to her house and demanded that she leave his domain. She laughed at him, killed him, and kept a chunk of him as a plaything, which is why he couldn't be named. He wasn't a complete being until he was able to reclaim that. Oh, no, see, I think that's a super fun story, I mean, I wouldn't want to one-shot that. I'd want to spend some time going and reclaiming myself and maybe facing down why did I think it was okay to try and just oust this incredibly powerful redcap who had every reason to have claim to her domain? Oh, yes, yeah. Sovereign. Oh, Sovereign. I'm so glad it's not the, the beast that it once was. The group that I'm playing with now, we found that the identity stuff is the most interesting part of the game for us. So we've, you know, been using a pretty heavily modified system from Dark Ages Fey. But one of the things we did was we reworked the epiphanies a little bit. The thing that's important for the story is we took Rapture, the self epiphany where you inspire yourself, and we made that the method you have to go through in order to increase your glamour. So for Cathane. You do that whole self-inspiration thing, and it brings you closer in touch with the thing you are. So it's always a project that involves getting in touch with you know, your nature as whatever kith you are. For the Nunahi, who are the only players who've gone through this at this point, it's about getting in touch with the thing you are culturally and spiritually. So it involves appealing to your totem. And we did a really fun kind of side quest thing when there was some downtime in the story where one of our characters did her epiphany for herself to get in touch with her totem to petition for more power, more knowledge, more wisdom, that sort of a thing, and to demonstrate that she was a good representative of her totem on Earth. And it went so sideways. It was so good because her totem is Mishipeshu, who is the drowning spirit, more or less, of Lake Superior. He's the guardian of a particular island, but the lake generally, and the copper deposits around the lake generally. But he's depicted as being a panther, which isn't a friendly animal. And they went through and accidentally taught Mishipeshu about human mercy and that's going to come back soon and it's going to be good yeah i i mean i honestly feel like changeling is all about identity the entire banality trigger what inspires and gives you glamour you know what dreamers are you drawn towards i feel like the whole game down to the systematic level centers on identity in a way that I don't really know that any other role-playing game that I've looked at really does. I almost think that that's part of the reason that the game tends to get lighthearted, even when you're not dealing with lighthearted stories. I've run into this even just in the first couple sessions of the campaign I'm running, and I think it's an important thing to keep in mind when structuring your stories, is with a lot of other World of Darkness games, you can get in and get really super dark, but, you know, your characters are dealing with, ultimately, you know, when things go wrong for them here, it attacks the core of who they are. It unmakes, you know, what they are. And there is this kind of desperate, ha ha ha, it's a silly boggin. Oh God, the world is being made, unmade over there. You know, and it, it reminds me of the quote from Matt McFarland, the current lead developer. And he had this quote, that I saw that someone told him years ago that 
Changeling is like someone holding you at gunpoint and screaming at you to be happy. I think a lot of that is drawn back to the fact that the game is all about identity. And, you know, it's beneficial to tell stories that lean into that. A thousand times I answer your prayer, and a thousand times you play me false. What friend are you, Merlin, to treat with me like this? Gentle woman, don't turn the fire of your gaze on my face. It turns my resolve to last winter's ash. Can't we stop talking like this now? Not as long as this room stands. Then, dear lady, I beg you, favor my petition and meet with the poet Marlowe. You've given me no cause to consider your odd request. Why should I give audience to a man who finds me... offensive? Consider your past. Nothing of my past is worth calling up. What would I summon? Paris? Troy? Perhaps Menelaus, that fat bag of wind? Lovely Helen, please consider. If he met you in person, he might change his view of you. Enough! I won't help you this time. Come now, let that glum shade slither from your face. It isn't very pretty. You have then come to accept your situation? I won't listen. You alone can dissuade him. I'm not interested. Consider the implications. He intends to write you into history as a demon, one who steals men's souls. I don't care what he accuses me of. It's a petty charge, insignificant compared to others lodged against me. Let him tell his stories. Then you have given up on yourself. Perhaps I prefer to be left alone. There is sanctuary here. It's kind of brutal when you get into that that space with the game because you you end up with a lot of the humor being moments where where the characters are able to really quintessentially be their id and it isn't at all moral it's not there's no super ego involved there it's id it's all id but at the same time there's like this horrific childlike revelry in it it's terrifying and it's really fun and it's it needs to be the spice of the story because most of the story needs to be about how that isn't okay. <laughs> yeah, I ran into that really hard in my Gen Con game. I don't want to go too far into because we, we did a little mini Gen Con episode, but you know, it was an incredibly fun game and it was incredibly hilarious and we had a ton of fun and my players were so amoral. And I did not know what to do with that. <laughs> like, I've had a moral players before. And not that the players themselves were without morals, generally. But they took their characters to that place. But there wasn't the same kind of glee about it as there ended up being in Changeling. And it, it it's just something about the setting that ends up producing a very happy tree friend sort of veneer over everything. I still don't entirely understand it because it manifests in my games at times when I am not evoking it intentionally, but I've reached the point where I just run with it. You are right, though, about most of the time you need to tell stories where it's like, okay, this is omnipresent, but it's not okay. And if you lean into it, we're going to do some bedlam and your human, the human half of your world is going to rebel against this. And, you know, it's the Tinkerbell phenomenon. You're only big enough for one emotion at a time. So when that little bit of like gleeful, violent sociopathy shows up that, you know, humans have a little bit of that in them, but it's tempered. But with the Fae, whatever they feel in the moment, that's all they feel. And it just... Again, they're not necessarily written that way as changelings, but it just seems to be what happens. You need to address that subject when you are setting up the game, and sometimes even during the game and between games. I've had multiple conversations with players 
around things that happened in the game. And like at one point, one of my players told me that she was thinking about her character developing a phobia of doctors, and it was because of things that happened in the game. And I was like, oh, is this bothering you? Do I need to stop leaning into this as part of your nightmare fodder? And she was like, no, I'm totally into it. We need to go into this as far as it goes because it's good. And like, I'm totally okay with that. I'm also totally okay with not doing that if it bothers her because it's a game. Yeah, and it should be fun. And there are certain games where you sit down and you know everyone that's coming to that table is okay going dark because they're playing that game. No one that sits down at a Wraith game if you have problems with those sorts of things, you shouldn't be sitting down at all. Not to say you shouldn't still negotiate exactly where your boundaries are, because Wraith can still overshoot. But, you know, everyone kind of comes with a baseline. With Changeling, that's not always true. Because the dark chocolate, bitter, twisted center of Changeling is hidden in all of these cotton candy layers. That sometimes people sit down and they just don't know. The first time I ran a con game of Changeling, I ran into that. Uh, there was a person who'd never played World of Darkness, and she did a great job with her character. But the first NPCs they interacted with were Redcaps. And the Redcaps got real hungry in all sorts of ways. I could tell from her response immediately. It's like, all right, I'm backing off this. But it was a con game. I didn't know her intimately the way I know the people around my you know, normal tables. And so I kind of had to just improv it and backpedal and read the room. But Changeling runs that risk. You know, it has these weird sociopathic tendencies, but people don't always see them coming. C20 does a better job of advertising that with Nightmare, with the way Bedlam works. It gives the storyteller a few more tools in long-form games to penalize players that get a little too slap-happy with their powers. Those systems do not work well in short-form games, unfortunately. It's like, oh, we're only going to play for three sessions? That's cool. I can, you know, bedlam lock three of my willpower and never actually have any repercussions. Let's do this. You really have to kind of build around player expectations and set them and have those conversations early on. And maybe do things like, if you know it's going to be a short-form game, tweak the nightmare systems a little have give nightmare a little more of an immediate repercussion you know you talk about that player that was like oh no i want to go as far into this at my gen con game my red cap i was doing a modified nightmare system more like what you do in the dark ages game if you roll a one on a nightmare die the nightmare goes away but something bad happens immediately i partially did that because it's a one shot and the nightmare system's just you'll never hit a repercussion in a one-shot. Oh, I earned 30 Nightmare. Who cares? Whatever. I'm not spending that much willpower. So I wanted Nightmare to mean something, even in a one-shot. And so he ended up super paranoid because he just kept rolling ones on Nightmare dice, and then he kept rolling tens and getting more Nightmare and unleashing, and he was just a never-ending cycle of paranoia and suffering in that game. And he loved it. Like, he got the weirdest twinkle in his eye when he was acting dysfunctionally and completely against the interests of the party. And he was having a great time, and so was everybody else. But I could very easily have seen that in a different player, be like, I'm not comfortable with this. Like, why are you making me so useless and toxic? We've only been playing for an hour and a half. But again, something about Changeling. In longer games, that works out a lot more organically, I suppose is the word. In ours, like we've had some nightmare blows. They've never been huge, but they've been middlingly traumatic for the people they've gone off for. And one of the things I've had people do, like in prep for that for their characters, is to like come up with some blue booking, like write down some of the things your character is concerned about whether they're things they're concerned about in the world, things they're concerned about in the Oath Circle, things they're concerned about internally or in their families, in their mortal families. And like that's a really good way to get people together and be like, look, bad stuff's going to happen to your character. I need to know what bad stuff is okay to use for this. Because you, like you said, you might have that player who doesn't enjoy thinking about their family getting sick so they won't write that one down 
on the flip side, if you do have those players who come up with characters who they really want to lean into the pathos of it, sometimes they come up with better ideas than you will as a storyteller. I think that's absolutely true. One of the players in my current campaign is building his character, and I said in our arts episode, no one took any seasonal arts, and he immediately made a liar out of me right after we recorded that episode. He's like, so I don't like my art selections. Can I change them? And it was super early, so I went, yeah, sure. What do you want to take? He's like, I want to take Autumn. I'm like, well, okay then. This is a 180, Mr. Puka fun-loving guy. All right, take Autumn. Mm. And we had a conversation about, you know, I wanted the seasonal arts to kind of be framed around long forgotten, little known magic. And I said, okay, you've got some remembrance. You can have Autumn, but given your backstory, I'm going to give it this relationship with this abuse in your backstory, because his character had an abusive parent situation. And the Autumn kind of gave him a way out of that. And he's like weirdly addicted to it. And it, but it makes him anxious. And I said, you know, are you cool with this? And he went, yeah, that, that sounds good. But I, you know, almost wanted to play the, his chrysalis was this little dark thing that rescued him and got him out of this situation. But it's not a fairy godmother. It's this little dark thing that's inside him. And he plays the fun-loving puka. But he has like two levels of autumn. You know, that's kind of always the edge with Changeling. And I, I really think it's worth talking through those things with your players a lot more with this game than, you know, with a lot of other games. will be like, what's your backstory? Cool. I'm going to abuse this. Let's go. And it works out. But I just feel like there's a lot more give and take with Changeling. It was incredible. It was an incredible surge of inspiration. It was spectacular. My fingers, they felt like they were on fire. I never felt this way, not even when I just started. And it's all thanks to you, that talk we had. This is your best work, Henry. The best you've ever done. Your technique is always impeccable. But this time, how to put it, you've poured your soul into this piece. This is more than a sculpture. It's it's a masterpiece. Can you feel the emotion it distills? Um, a masterpiece? Undoubtedly. The best you've ever done. And will ever do. What? What have you done? Why would you do that? The human soul has immense potential. A little spark can create a wonder never seen before or since. Knowing how to use that power, Henry, is of the utmost importance. What are you? A sadist? First you inspire me, then you destroy my art. Are you out of your mind? That's not true at all, my friend. Believe it or not, I don't enjoy the destruction per se but it provides that which I need. I'm going to kill you, motherfucker. I'm going to bust your head open No, and... you won't. On oh. your knees. I understand your wrath. But there's nothing I can do for you, for the human soul is powerful, and I need that power in order to stay alive. You'll never create anything, Henry. Never again. Everything you do from now on will have perfect technique, but it will be as empty as you feel now. What good is an artist incapable of creating art? You know you're better than this. It's better to end things before they end you. Goodbye, Henry. And thank you. A lot of the core dynamics in the political game of Changeling are candy veneered abuse situations anyway. The feudal system, for example. The history between the Cathane and the Nunahi. The history between all of the Fae and humanity. And the Fae are on the outs right now, but they're on the outs for a reason. And it's not that they were 
beneficent, lovely fairy godmothers to all the little children. Like, there's abuse all the way through Changeling. That's something that I think lends itself to really learning about the setting that you're going to be building your story in. Because there are the intimate abuse stories. There, you know, there are the stories about the people you're feeding on or the people that, you know, feed on you and destroy your wonder because it's a very two-way street with the changeling. It's not a one-way thing. But at the same time, the Fae will are also tied very much to place. Historically, Fae stories were about, oh, I am the fairy of this grove. I am the fairy of this house. You know, I am the clerican of this particular wine cellar. And so knowing the history of where you're building your story makes a big difference. I've had a lot of fun researching Asheville in North Carolina, which is where my current chronicle is set, and reading up about some of the recent news with the Eastern Band of the Cherokee, because I want the Nunahee to tap into what's really going on with them right now, their politics and their place in the modern world. I don't want it to be, oh, yay, we're, you know, nature spirits hidden off in the middle of nowhere. And no, I, I, I want the Nunahee to be a reflection of the Eastern Band Cherokee's place in the world right now. Their relationship with the white population of that region of the world and their relationship with the United States and all of these feudal power structures, you know, we've talked in previous games about the Xi very possibly representing a return to more feudal thought in American governance. So that ties the Xi to American ideas of leadership. You know, what are all of those relationships and what do they mean in that particular region? And I think that recognizing the strong identity themes and the really strong abuse themes in Changeling necessitate a little more local research than some of the other games do. Yeah, I know for me personally, setting, like location setting, ends up being a really strong inspiration in every story I tell. I recently took a little vacation up to Lake Superior, where our game is taking place, and I was telling one of my players about it afterwards, and she, <laughs> and she said, wow, you must be really obnoxious to travel with, because I can just imagine you walking around and just saying out loud, oh yeah, I could totally use that. Oh yeah, no, that'd be great. Oh, I should take a picture of that, because I want to use that. I mean, I'm totally that person, too. <laughs> I am... Yeah, if I ever actually traveled to any of the places that I've set my games, and my games are never set where I live. I've done a con game or two that are set where I live, and all the rest of my games are set in the most obscure, weird cities I can find. Asheville is downright mainstream for me. I hate setting things places like New York or Chicago or Seattle because it's all so obvious. You know, I, I took a mage game and we wandered through India and into the Hindu dreaming and out into China and up to Mongolia because I just, I have this almost frenetic addiction to new settings in my games. <laughs> but I did a Wraith game in this obscure little town in Scotland because I wanted some place where I could have a necropolis and a power structure that the hierarchy overall wouldn't care about and Scotland because that'll be great and no one had heard of it and I researched the history there and buildings that had been destroyed so I could have them show up in the Shadowlands and you know what the politics were and what the identity of the people that lived there and their view of their town because all of that you know played into the necropolis I built not a thing that showed up in any White Wolf book ever, because why would that town show up in a White Wolf book? And I just, I get into that even more with Changeling, because all of the little, like, myths and ideas and thoughts and bits of inspiration are dreaming manifestations. And I'm on totally the other side of that spectrum, where I think every one of my White Wolf games that I've run has taken place somewhere I've lived. Our mage game took place in Detroit, which is an amazing setting for things like that because they have the Red Devil Parade, which is amazing. Like all of these games, 
they're an opportunity for me to learn even more about the place that I thought I knew. Like, the history of Duluth has been super, super dark, and I had no idea. And even that one shot that I ran for you guys in Chicago, that took place in Minneapolis, because it's easy for me to run that. I can vamp with it super easily. And there's just a level of familiarity that like I get having a negative space to build something and it's it's helpful in a lot of ways too but especially with changeling you can superimpose the dreaming on so many things so much better if you know what the feeling you had in that place was yeah that's that's really true and I did I ran into that a lot not so much with the changeling game that I set in my current neighborhood I've run the Changeling game in my neighborhood as the last two Changeling Con games, but that was set in 1925 around the opening of the Uptown Theater. And so this gets into, you know, kind of how you build stories is finding things in the world that tap the major themes and anxieties of Changeling. And one of those is death and just being terrified of death and trying to avoid it and run away from it. And the Uptown Theater is just this corpse in the middle of my neighborhood. It has this horrible, awful, tragic history. And it can't be torn down because it's a historic building, and it would take $70 million to fix it. But when it opened, it was the largest, the most elaborate cinema palace in the country. And I told this whole story about it opening because I know how I felt looking at those photos. But at the same time, I don't know, it's it's one of those things where I can almost get dragged too far in. That one was set far enough away that I was sort of removed. But with the Wraith game, I ran also as a sequel to that Changeling game. Like, there's a lot of really violent gentrification going on in my neighborhood, and there are a lot of people being displaced, and... You know, they're in the middle of turning what was a school that was open and vibrant when I moved here and then was part of the mass Chicago shutdowns, and now they're turning them into luxury flats. And I started telling this whole story about that act of making the thing something that wasn't the fetter of the wraith that had taught there and nurtured children and protected kids from abuse, even as a wraith, and how it wasn't destroyed destroyed like they didn't destroy the building it's there but what it was that she had an emotional relationship with was destroyed and that prompted a harrowing and to be honest like getting into that story was exhausting and it kind of cut me and those were one shots so i don't know i i almost feel like my need to like move from place to place is almost kind of like i can get sucked way too far down that hole. The other really useful thing I get out of placing games where, in places I'm familiar with, is the politics, especially in Changeling, but also in Mage a little bit. The politics of the location blend into the game's politics really easily. Around here, there's been a recent push to recognize the history of the area as Dakota land. And part of that is involved renaming some local parks. Part of that's involved a art installation that went into a park near here that represented some pretty traumatic history for the Dakota Indians. There was no outreach by the art organization beforehand. So people were, you know, taking the bus to work and suddenly saw the thing that set off the Dakota War just sitting next to the bus. So, especially in Changeling, layering that kind of psychic trauma into chimerical reality or the dreaming or even just the politics of the Fae generally in the area is super ripe. It's really, really easy to do. It's not easy to do well. And some of these things I've avoided dealing with because I don't think I have the chops for them. And that also gets back into you need to talk to your players about what you're doing, <laughs> like straight up, because some of that stuff is stuff I wouldn't touch with a 10 foot pole. But some of it is. And like working local politics into 
the games, it gives it a weird kind of flavor because you've got the banal reality of the situation bleeding into chimerical reality. What does that mean? Like when that art structure was destroyed, it was destroyed in a burning ceremony, which was a huge point of contention because the white people looked at that and went, oh my God, they're burning art. And the Native Americans were like, no, this is a purification ritual. Go fuck yourselves. And it happened at another spiritually significant location for both groups. And like, if I ever really get into telling that story, I think that's the creation of a Nunahi freehold, to be completely honest. I feel like a lot of local politics gets into really good space like that for Changeling. There was a story I saw several years ago. Um, I want to say this was up in Alaska. I forget what the breed of whale was. It's a smaller whale and had been endangered for many years, but populations were much higher and it was taken off the endangered list. So this is this is an animal that is thriving again. And one of the the tribes had traditionally hunted these whales for food and for other sorts of materials that they used, you know, in day-to-day life. It wasn't all food. And I mean, when I say hunted, I mean like in longboats with hand-thrown harpoons. This is an incredibly low volume hunting sort of activity, and they had respected the endangered species ban, but when it was lifted, they went out and wanted to start hunting these whales again as a way to reconnect with their culture. And the protests were just really violent. They were really strong, and basically the protest resulted in the U.S. government putting this whale back on the endangered species list, even though from a purely ecological standpoint, it no longer qualified. And I just looked at that and I'm like, to me, that is such a quintessential Nunahi story, but the politics of it are so ugly. And the, just entirely down to like the the harvesting of medicine from, in this case, the sea. But, you know, it there are so many parallels there But tapping into that is so complicated and so weird, and I would not tell that story myself. Like, I see all the parallels there, but I do not think I have the chops for it. It's that exact same sort of situation. And it gets into a heaviness of, you know, what does it mean to try to reconnect? What is the nature of this particular little corner of the cycle of abuse that so much of changeling embodies like i want to be able to tap those sorts of things but should i i mean it's knowing what's really going on helps you tell an authentic story but i I find i do hit walls pretty often in oh nope i'm not really totally comfortable going there yeah and that's that's totally fair and that needs to be part of the ongoing conversation between you know the storyteller and the players apart from the table, the, like, is this something we're comfortable with conversation is super important, and we keep coming back to it. Earthquake! Yelled Clifford Sifton. Earthquake! Yelled Bill Burson. Earthquake! Yelled Dr. Joseph Haval. Earthquake. Earthquake! Yells Coyote. <laughs> nah. Clifford Sifton and Lewis Pick watched the Nissan, the Pinto, and the Carmen Ghia float into the dam just as the earthquake began. Almost imperceptibly, the waters swelled and the cars were thrown into the dam, hard, insistent, and before either man realized what was happening, A tremor rolled out of the west, tipping the lake on its end. Pick and Sifton were knocked to the ground, and as they tried to stand, they were knocked down again. It was comical at first, the two men trying to find their footing, the cars smashing into the dam, the lake curling over the top. But, beneath the power and the motion, there was a more ominous sound of things giving way, of things falling apart. Sifton felt it first, a sudden shifting, a sideways turning, 
a flexing, the snapping crack of concrete and steel, and in that instant the water rose out of the lake like a mountain, sucking the cars under and pitching them high in the air, sending them at the dam in an awful rush. And the dam gave way, and the water and the cars tumbled over the edge of the world. From the tour bus, Dr. Haveau and Babo watched the dam burst. Several of the passengers took out their cameras, but as they were at lake level, there was little to see. It must be a spectacular sight from down below, said a man near the back. Dr. Haveau sagged against the bus, took out a book, and held it up. It's all here, he said to Babo. I was right, after all. Sorry about your car, said Babo. The dates. Looks like I lost mine, too. The places! Babo looked at Dr. Haveau, and then she turned and watched the lake race for the breach in the dam. From the vantage point of his lot, Bill Bursum watched his shoreline disappear. He stood transfixed for a moment and then began walking toward the lake, trotting after the retreating water. Now what's gone wrong? he shouted, breaking into a run across the immense mud flat that had appeared beneath his feet and slowly curved out in all directions. What the hell has gone wrong now? Below, in the valley, the water rolled on, as it had for an eternity. The other thing that we haven't talked about so much is navigating some of the dynamic weirdness of the systems of Changeling and how they can impact your story. I feel like similar to Mage, Changeling comes with a lot of really dynamic, unpredictable system elements around the weirdness of the arts and players pulling out really unexpected uses of them. You have seen a fair number of conversations online about people basically saying, yeah, I, I will totally put a kibosh on XYZ. No, I don't want my players to quote unquote power game. You know, we, we had an exchange at one point you know, with someone online who was talking about how the arts were too expensive. And I remember we were both like, uh, but they're, they're crazy powerful and you mix them with realms and they do all these things. And the response was, oh, well, you know, we don't power game. I'm like, but you've lowered the cost of your arts. I mean, it was, it was a strange back and forth, but it, it did sort of bring into focus for me that not everyone sees the arts in the same way and understands their potential in the same way. I think with C20, that exchange was before C20 came out, you know, the arts are explained a little bit better, but there's still a lot of unpredictability in terms of if you don't really have experience as a storyteller with a particularly innovative combination of realm and power, especially like some of the time stuff that just dramatically expands how you can use an art and if you get that one creative player navigating that is is something that has to be very thoughtfully done in a lot of ways changeling is sort of like DD &D in that way D, D has really discrete powers that aren't particularly dynamic until you start mixing and matching them and like with changeling holly strike is really really straightforward it does damage what that means changes based on what realms that player has. You know, I was the first person in one of our games to put Holly Strike together with Scene. And Holly Strike plus Scene plus Prop equals buildings fall down with enough successes, and it's not that many. It just, it doesn't even take that much lateral thinking to come up with some of the combinations that are really, really horrifically powerful. <laughs> You know, if if you're really good at just rolling with what your players throw at you, then it can be fine. But I've met a lot of storytellers that have an idea in their head, maybe not that they're going to, you know, railroad their players exactly into, but a rough idea of where things are heading. And, you know, in general, the advice for storytellers is don't get too married to a, a endpoint because you're probably not going to get there. But I feel like that's kind of triply true for really Changeling and Mage are the two games where I've just found, no, you can't have an endpoint in mind because you're not going to get there. Especially now with Unleashing, I 
oh man, just unleashing has a way of completely rewriting a game progression. Yeah, I've actually, I, I have really, really enjoyed the times that my players have unleashed, and we're not using the C20 system. But unleashing's kind of the same thing, and the most recent instance of a player coming up with an unleashing that was not something I'd considered was actually really good, because they had this NPC they were interacting with that had been affected by the mists and couldn't remember the information they wanted and didn't even know they knew it. The player came up with an unleashing using Dawn, and part of Dawn's purview is the past. And her unleashing was, okay, I am going to unleash Dawn, we're going to look at the past that this person experienced, and I'm going to imprint it on this other object, essentially making dross, but the only thing it can do is relay that experience. And I was like, okay, I have no idea if it's actually supposed to do that, but that is super interesting and we're going to go with it. That's one of the things that I really like about Unleashing, is it brings in a little bit more ability for players to engage in the story directly. To be like, no, I'm going to grab this story by the reins and drag it off in a different direction. And I've seen in a lot of more modern role-playing game systems and some newer ones that don't come with all the, I'll say, baggage of the World of Darkness, they're starting to build ways directly for a player to literally just take the reins from the storyteller for a few sentences and say, I'm going to put this thing in the scene and, you know, try to move things. And Changeling doesn't have that, but I feel like unleashing, if you as a storyteller are willing to let your players engage with that and encourage it, can kind of give them some of that by proxy. Mm-hmm. There was a writing class I took a long, long time ago. At one point, the um, the professor went around the room with his bag, and she had everybody stick their hand in the bag and pull something out. It was just full of random debris, like pencils, and like those weird little hotel clocks that people sometimes have, just little cheap stuff you can get from the dollar store or from garbage cans. And after she was done, she, you know, I already had something, and she said, okay. So that last piece you wrote for this class, rewrite it and incorporate that object. That's kind of what unleashing is. <laughs> it really is, and I kind of love it. The only thing, and I think this is important for storytellers to keep in mind, unleashing can also completely and utterly strip agency away from players if you aren't careful about it, because technically... Every changeling in the room can unleash, and the storyteller has access to way more changelings than the players do. And that's something that I've really had to think about really carefully is, okay, as the storyteller, how am I going to engage with my NPCs unleashing? Because, man, unleashing some of the arts, like, oh, I have an NPC with Autumn, and you have just pissed them off royally. I'm going to have them unleash Autumn on you. And they have a lot of it. So they can rack up four successes and still maintain control of the effect. Okay, let's tango. But at the same time, like, I want to do that. I want to feel like I can do that. But at the same time, I have to be like, ooh, where has the power level of this game really scaled? You know, you have to be much more considered with how you leverage that power against players because it can really easily turn into a kind of an uncool cock block. You know, not everybody's going to be the kind of storyteller who can roll with agency in their players. I give extra XP whenever players do something that is remarkably in character, but also obviously a colossally bad idea. So, like, I go out of my way to give my my players incentive to take those moments where it's like, yes, I want the story to go in this direction. Yes, I realize this is a stupid idea. And unleashing, especially berserk unleashings, are beautiful. They're so beautiful for that. Yeah, and it's it's interesting. I've seen a number of people say that they don't like how unshaped unleashing is. 
that it feels like it's cheap, like it's an out. I've seen that critique before C20 came out about Dark Ages Fae. I've seen that critique from a few people about C20. It doesn't seem to be the pervasive thought. But I've seen a handful of people critique Unleashing. And my experience with Unleashing is that it's been super fun. But my experience with it thus far has been in one-shots. I'm looking forward to using Unleashing in a setting where... (laughs) Is, is the nightmare worth it? Like, is the glamour expenditure worth it? Do you really want to be completely desperately just, like, gasping for glamour in three games? Because that's your trajectory right now. You've unleashed twice. Like, what are you doing? So in our game, we're, we're not using the C20 unleashing rules. We're using the Dark Ages Fey unleashing rules, where you've got three outcomes for unleashing. You've got, you succeeded. Yay. You've got, you did way better than you meant to. You got more successes than you could control. You still got your objective accomplished, but you've gone really far into unforeseen consequences territory, and it's almost worse than if you'd failed. And then there's botch, where everything you were trying to do either goes completely backwards, or more often, you failed to get it out of you. So it just affects you, and those are often pretty catastrophic. The thing is... The thing that makes that a little bit more reasonable is in Dark Ages Fae, you also have weaving energy, and you can spend that to get control of a Berserk unleashing. You can't fix a botch with it, but you can negate successes to bring it back down to controlled. I feel like there's a really juicy way to bring that, do you want to drag this unleashing back into control, in to changeling the dreaming by making it not even banality triggers i almost feel like i want to give my players the option to negate successes but to do it they just have to straight up take as many temporary banality as it takes to drag the unleashing back into control like i like the idea of giving them that option and it's a terrible option i mean that's stupid expensive yeah, that. But gosh, sometimes you'd be in, well. I mean, it's it's thematically correct. You can invoke the autumn to cancel out cantrips, although unleashings are weird. They are, but it's it's more about like shutting yourself down enough to close the fire hose and the damage it does to yourself, to your own like sense of what you are, to put yourself in that situation where there is so much toxic energy you have to negate i i like the idea of opening that possibility i don't know that my players would take advantage of it but i i like the idea of it being there so yeah unleashing and interacting between the arts and the realms can be hard to deal with if you as a storyteller aren't really really comfortable with either being aware of what your players are capable of and their characters are capable of or being comfortable not knowing what they're capable of but knowing what you're capable of in the moment, and sometimes being ready to call a timeout so you can reformulate for a few minutes. Because <laughs> I've done that a lot. Oh, yeah, I mean, there's the running gag of when the storyteller says he's going to the restroom, it's just because he hates his players and needs to brainstorm while not looking at their faces. I mean, <laughs> we've all been there. Oh, yes. All right, so... This was a little bit more rambly, conversation-y than our usual episodes are, but I hope we managed to convey a little bit of the idea of the chaos and the planning that needs to go into running a Changeling game. I hope that we gave you some ideas that you might want to use in your own games, or at the very least, ideas you might want to avoid entirely. And as always, I'm Simon, and Victor and I will be back at you with our next episode. conversation with
Chrysalis by Rocia Vega, Touch by Catherine Larley, Chrysalis again, and Green Grass Running Water by Thomas King. The music from this episode was LSD by Montplaisir and Abandoned Ballroom by Lyndon Scarfi. Additional vocal talent by Cosmo Cahill. Today's poorly explained echo. Every time you take out your phone at the gaming table, your storyteller dies on the inside.